It's not if I could, I would. It's if I would, I could. If I will, I can. So start the new process. A major key for bringing joy into our lives lies in the next word we shall briefly examine. Discipline. If there is a magic word that stands out above all the rest, this is the one. Discipline. And in this program, you'll discover how positive this word is. Discipline is the bridge between thought and accomplishment. The bridge between inspiration and value achievement. The bridge between necessity and productivity. Remember, all good things are upstream. The passing of time takes us adrifting. And drifting only brings us the negative, the disastrous, the disappointment and the failure. Failure is not a cataclysmic event. It is not generally the result of one major incident, but rather a long list of accumulated little failings. Failing in life is failing to think today, failing to act today, failing to care, to strive, to climb, to learn, to keep trying day by day. If your goal requires that you write 10 letters today and you write only three, you are down seven letters. If you want to make five calls and you only make one, you are down four on calls. If your plan calls for saving $10 today and you save none, you're down $10 today. Now the danger is looking at an undisciplined day and concluding that no great harm has been done. It doesn't seem like such a bad day. But add up these days to make a year, and then add up those years to make a lifetime, and perhaps you can now see how repeating today's small failures can easily turn your life into a major disaster. Success, on the other hand, is just the same process in reverse. If you plan to make 10 calls, and you end the day making 15, now you're up five calls. If you then get up a few on letters, move up the savings numbers, you can see what a massive difference it could make in a year and what wealth and accomplishment awaits for a lifetime. Discipline is like a set of magic keys that unlocks all the doors of wealth, happiness, sophistication, culture, high self-esteem, pride, joy, accomplishment, satisfaction, and success. The first key to discipline is awareness of the need for and the value of discipline and especially the discipline to make the changes. What will it take? What must I do? And what must I become to get all I want from my life? The second key is the willingness. More than that, the eagerness to maintain your new discipline deliberately, wisely, consistently. And the third key to discipline is the commitment to master the circumstances of your daily life to see and harness the opportunities to make something of the sun and the rain, the good as well as what comes in the guise of misfortune. Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude. And the good feeling you get, that surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline, is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment of the discipline. Second, a new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately. That is yet to come. But you can change direction immediately. And direction is very important. Third, discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be. And that striving to become is what discipline is all about. Disciplining ourselves to fulfill our natural potential to become all that we can be. And finally, discipline attracts opportunity. Opportunity is always looking for ambition and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment. The human will in action, driven by inspiration, enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. Discipline, those unique steps of intelligent thought and activity that put a lid on temper and a faucet on courtesy, 
that develop positive and control negative, that encourage success and deter failure, that design lifestyle and control frustration, that enhance health and curb sickness, that promote happiness and manage sadness. Having an aim and moving towards it, then we are by attainment. And what that means is you have to have an aim, and that means you have to have an interpretation. And it also means that the nobler the aim, that's one way of thinking about it, the better your life. All right, so you're always in one of these little frameworks, and there's just no getting out of it. So, and that's because, you know, at any given moment, this is like, it's like field theory. There used to be psychological theories that talked about the field of human experience, something like that. And this is kind of what that is. This is a field, and basically what happens is you parse out a little part of the world, say, and so an amount you can handle. So let's say it has some duration, you're not aiming at something 50 years in the future, it's because how the hell are you going to do that? You, there's too many variables, you know. So you're aiming at some handleable amount of time, and you posit a goal in there, and you plot your route, and then that tells you what's up, and tells you what's down, because up moves you towards the goal, and down moves you away from the goal, and that sets up your motivational framework, so that you have something worth attaining. You know, that's a really interesting thing to know, too, is like, why have a goal? Well, it's easy. No goal, no positive emotion. Because you experience positive emotion by noticing that you're moving towards a goal. And so if you don't have a, have a goal, well, you can't have any positive emotion. So, you better have a goal. And so, you might say, well, what should the goal be? Well, we could start by saying, well, any goal is better than none. And then we might say, well, it should be a goal that other people will let you pursue, because otherwise it's going to be kind of difficult. And maybe they'll be even happy to help you pursue it, that would even be better. And maybe it's a goal that would enable you to learn how to pursue other goals while you pursue that goal. Boy, that would really be good. And so you can see that your goal is parameterized, but that doesn't mean that any old goal works. It means there's some goals that work nicely and some not so nicely. There are playable games and non-playable games. That's a good way of thinking about it. And you want to have a playable game. And there's a lot of them. Lawyer, plumber, you know, actor, whatever. They're, they're playable games. And, and it's not obvious which one's better, but it's certainly obvious which ones are sustainable and which ones are worse. And so there's a set of playable games. And you need to extract from that set of playable games a game that suits you. And that would be partly due to your temperament, you know, because extroverted people want to play an extroverted game. And, Highly neurotic people want to play a safe game, and agreeable people want to play a generous game, and disagreeable people want to play a game that's highly competitive so they can win, and, you know, fine. But they're all within the realm of playable games, and that means they're socially acceptable as well. And so, that means it isn't just arbitrary, it isn't just relative what you decide to do, it's heavily parameterized. There's only there's a set of playable games, and it's large, the set is large, but it, it, there are commonalities within it. And that's why there are commonalities, that's why morality has a common basis, fundamentally. And so that's partly what we're trying to investigate, is like, what's up, what does up mean? What does it mean? Is there such a thing? Now, one thing to remember is that if you don't erect a hierarchical structure with, a, with something to aim at, you got no positive motivation because you experience positive motivation in relationship to a goal, not from attaining the goal. That's satisfaction. And besides, it's fleeting. You know perfectly well. You graduate from university, poof, next day you have a problem, which is what do you do next? And that's a, that's a tough problem. It's not like you've solved your problems by winning that game. You just introduced the problem of having to introduce another game. So it's unreliable as a source of positive emotion, but what's reliable is you set a goal and you try to attain it. And then that gives your life, that literally provides your life with meaning. That's what meaning is. Now it's more than that, but that's, that's what it is. And so then you might ask yourself, well, what's a really good goal? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. What's a really good goal? Okay, well, so... So that, that, that's another issue in some sense that seems to make the postmodernist critique even more correct. How in the world are you going to extract out a canonical interpretation of something like that? It's like it's not possible. But here's the issue, as far as I can tell. 
the interpret so the postmodernists extended that critique to the world. They said, look, while well, a text is complicated enough, you can't extract out a canonical interpretation. What about the world? The world's way more complicated than a text, and so there's an infinite number of ways that you can look at the world. And so how do we know that any one way is better than any other way? And that's a good question. My one hope today is, is, to, is that I can be a source of some inspiration. I'm going to address my remarks to anybody who's ever felt inferior or felt disadvantaged, felt screwed by life. This is a speech for the quad. Well, I was on television by the time I was 19 years old. And in 1986, I launched my own television show with a relentless determination to succeed. At first, I was nervous about the competition, and then I became my own competition, raising the bar every year, pushing, pushing, pushing myself as hard as I knew. Sound familiar to anybody here? Eventually, we did make it to the top, and we stayed there for 25 years. The Oprah Winfrey Show was number one in our time slot for 21 years. And I have to tell you, I became pretty comfortable with that level of success. But a few years ago, I decided, as you will at some point, that it was time to recalculate, find new territory, break new ground. So I ended the show and launched OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network. One year later, after launching OWN, nearly every media outlet had proclaimed that my new venture was a flop. Not just a flop, but a big, bold flop, they call it. I can still remember the day I opened up USA Today and read the headline, Oprah not quite standing on her own. It, it, it really was this time last year the worst period in my professional life. I was stressed and I was frustrated and quite frankly I was I was actually I was embarrassed. It doesn't matter how far you might rise at some point you are bound to stumble because if you're constantly doing what we do raising the bar if you are constantly pushing yourself higher higher the law of averages, not to mention the myth of Icarus, uh, predicts that you will at some point fall. And when you do, I want you to know this, remember this, there is no such thing as failure. Failure is just life trying to move us in another direction. Now, when you're down there in a the hole, it looks like failure. So this past year, I had to spoon feed those words to myself. And when you're down in the hole, when that moment comes, it's really okay to feel bad for a little while. Give yourself time to mourn what you think you may have lost. But then, here's the key. Learn from every mistake. Because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes, are there to teach you and force you into being more of who you are. And then figure out what is the next right move. And the key to life is to develop an internal, moral, emotional GPS that can tell you which way to go.
Thank you.